Uh, We're going to start with our land acknowledgement statement, and uh, this is something, so I'm going to turn it over to Gabe Powers, our conservation ecology manager, uh, to begin. All right. Uh, my, good morning. My name is Gabe Powers. Uh, I currently serve as the conservation ecology manager with the district. just want to thank everyone for joining us here on this uh, gorgeous day in this beautiful preserve that we uh, lovingly refer to as Glacial Park. Uh, for those that are unfamiliar with the Conservation District, uh, it was created by a group of conservation-minded individuals in 1971, and uh, through voter referendum, the district exists to preserve uh, open spaces and protect wildlife habitat, provide educational opportunities and outdoor recreation to the public. Currently, the district has around 26,000 acres of open space protected. And this park in particular receives its name due to the uh, Delta came and other chemic features uh, created through the glaciation period. The uh, glacial park is around 3,400 acres. I know that you're gonna see some additional open space to the north of us that uh, will protect approximately 6,000 acres of connected open space. But the, the glacial park preserve in particular is home to about 40 uh, Illinois threatened and endangered species, around 490 acres of Illinois nature preserve so uh, really qual quality park and uh, conservation area for the public glacial park and McHenry county in general are part of the traditional homelands of many indigenous groups and tribal nations including the ho-chunk the kickapoo the lakota dakota the muskutin miami peoria potawatomi sauk and meskwaki we celebrate these special places, seek to learn and honor the history of those who came before us, and strive to forge meaningful relationships with the indigenous communities to deepen our collective connection to the land. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. Well, welcome. Uh, again, glad to have everybody here in person. And for those that are remote that you joined us this morning, um, we'll go ahead and start with introductions, and we'll start here going around the room, and then uh, we'll get everyone on home that's at, at home to be able to share uh, where you're from uh, as part of our partner introductions. So, Mark, I'll turn it to you, please. Hey, I'm Mark Bowman uh, with the Field Museum, and I also serve as the treasurer for the Alliance. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Uh, John Lawson, Lake Valley Forest Preserve and Lake County Board. Uh, Oh, yeah, unless you want to know more. <laughs> uh, Cynthia Tanner, Executive Director of Prairie State Conservation Coalition and the McHenry County Resident. Jerry Patton, the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning and Security. Bob Fisher, the Bird Conservation Network Coalition of about 20 different uh, bird, birding and bird conservation groups. Uh, John McCabe, I'm the director of the Department of Resource Management at the Forest Preserve for Cook County. I'm here today to listen to the meeting and also present on um, some community wildfire preparedness. My name is John Peters, the general restoration ecology manager for the um, Center for Conservation Assistance. Hi, Abigail Gerdiewicz. I'm at the Field Museum and chair of the Institute. Ted Hafner, um, many tasks, but today is a uh, Green Vision Initiative Coordinator for Chicago Wilderness Alliance. Hi, I'm Bob Luke, I'm a uh, based on the in Chicago to seek solutions of the Cloud and Rainbow, and I will go and land in the same Good morning, everyone. Emily Reichswig, uh, Vice President of Conservation and Policy at Open Lands, and a steering committee member of the UA. Uh, Vince Bosk, I'm the ecologist. My day job is Hay Associates, and then I'm on the Friends of Habitat National Wildlife Refuge Board. Let me probably introduce Gabe. Um, and for those at home, so uh, let's see here if we just want to, how do you want to handle this? Um, Lake, do you want to kind of call on or raise hands and then, <clears throat> or just. Yeah. Have a introduce yourself and call yep. out names. Lake, if you could <laughs> introduce yourself and then call out names, please. Yep, that works. Uh, hi, I'm Lake Schulte. I'm the program assistant with Chicago Wilderness Alliance, and we will just go down the list and go to Anya. Hi, I'm Anya Cronenberg, and I'm here for the summer as an intern with Maria Mora. Okay. Maria? 
Hey everyone, I'm Maria Sadowski. I'm a communications consultant with the Chicago Wilderness Alliance. Benjamin. Good morning, Ben Snyder, um, fire supervisor with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Brittany. Brittany. Hi, Brittany Bomber with the Forest Preserves of Cook County. All right, Kathy. Um, oh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Kathy Garrity. I'm with the Forest Preserves of Cook County, and I'm also on the steering committee of CWA, and I'm co-chair for the uh, Protecting Landscapes for Biodiversity Conservation. And I just want to say it's hard to hear some of the people in the room. Elizabeth, it's really here, easy to hear you, but others are hard to hear. Thank you, Kathy. I'm right by the speaker. That's, okay. that's why. All right, Daniel. Good morning, everybody. Daniel Suarez, Senior Conservation Manager with Audubon Great Lakes and also co-chair of the CWA Ad Team. Diana. Good morning, everyone. My name is Diana Krug. I'm with the Forest Preserve District of Cook County. All right. Jack. Hi there. Um, Jack Brunner with Petrotech, also uh, working on the uh, CWA mapping hub team as well. Hi, everybody. Jane. Good morning, Jane McBride. I'm an individual member, but I'm also a state representative for Project Coyote. Um, Madeline? Hi, good morning. I'm um, Madeline Tudor with the Color Science Action Center at the Field Museum, and I'm um, working on the CWA CAPN project to center um, Native voices and Native communities in, in that project. Happy to be here. All right, Noreen. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Noreen Rana, Senior Project Manager with Chicago Park District's Natural Areas team. All right, Victoria. Good morning, everyone. Victoria Wittig. I'm the ambassador of the Northwest Indiana Urban Waters Federal Partnership and currently serve as vice chair of the Alliance. Okay, Lindsay. Hi, good morning. Lindsay Vasek, I'm with ComEd. I lead our uh, stewardship and biodiversity initiatives. Okay, and then we have an iPhone in here, but Lindsay, I think that is, was that you? I think it's me, yeah, I'm, I'm logged in both computer and, and phone, sorry about that. Nope, you're good, just didn't want to miss anybody, all right. Thank you, Lake yeah, and Sergio. <laughs> yeah, I just walked in. Uh, my name is Sergio Vargas. I'm the Wildlife Conservation Manager of the Illinois Biological Council. Wonderful. And if we, I think we've gotten around. Laura, did you want to do an introduction? Oh, Laura Riley, Managing Director of Chicago Women's Alliance. Nice to see you all. Wonderful. Thank you so much here. So I'm going to try to tag team here. I believe the next item that we have is the uh, shared agreements that we have adopted as part of our meeting protocol. Um, just, and these are very simple, uh, just to remind everyone again to be present, actively listen and participate, uh, giving others the opportunity to speak. We'll follow our agenda for today. And it's really important to ask clarifying questions because we're here to have a great dialogue and everybody's thoughts and opinions are really important. So thank you for being part of this. Um, we uh, also have a shout out just for a lot of new members that have come forth, and I know we're going to go through today, but just it's great to see our partnerships growing from the four state region. And uh, again, not only just at the local government level, but nonprofits, corporations, and then also at the state and federal agencies. So thank you for that. So the first thing of business uh, for our agenda today, um, if there are any agendas to be added to today's agenda, otherwise I'll take a motion to accept the agenda as presented. I'm having a hard time finding the link to the agenda. Link to the agenda, okay. Can you drop right. it in the yeah. chat? Can you drop the link to the chat? Yeah. Is everybody else able to follow us on the... Um, 
Yeah, Laura sent it yesterday. Oh, you did send it yesterday. It's in the message, the email message. Got it. I'll pop it. Thank you. Okay, with that, if everybody's logged on, I'll take a motion to accept the agenda as presented. Thank you, Ted. Do I have a second? Emily, thank you. Any discussion on the agenda? There being none, uh, all those in favor of approving the agenda as presented, motion by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Sorry, we'll wait. delay. We'll have to wait for everybody at home. Thank you. Are you able to hear us okay? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Um, the next order of business we have is our consent agenda. And uh, just to go over in details here, so I think the first slide you have is we have new partners. Laura, do you want to make some introductions on these, please? Uh, yeah. We have um, Mama Earth Wellness and Gre Greener Glenview, the Shawnee Park and Climate Alliance, Light of Loving Kindness, and Sex Solutions and Project Coyote. And I know that we have Oliver and also uh, Mary on the phone representing both of those new organizations. I don't know if anyone is here from the other new partners, but welcome. We're happy to have you here today with us. And I believe on the new partners, there was a link or there is on Session Lab on a ballot to accept these executive council partners into the executive council. So and it was unanimous. Uh, it was so. unanimous. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you. Great news on that. Um, and then we have the executive council minutes from our last meeting, which was April 17th. And then the treasurer's report, and I'll turn that over to Mark to give a All overview. Right. So we stand uh, at the end of June at a total of uh, 487989 in net assets. And just by point of comparison last year at this time we were at 372,000 so we're up 31 percent from from last year and a, a big piece of that is the IDNR funding that was received uh, over the course of the last year that helped us to um, go from last year's 90,000 in revenues to 166,000 at this point so far this year which is an increase of 83 percent um, over the year to year. Uh, obviously, we've done some uh, increase in expenditures as well, but that's only a 43% increase. So our overall net assets are up 30%, as I, as I mentioned. Um, so that's, it's kind of a lull in the action in terms of revenue these days. Um, we um, sort of get the member dues and um, so forth early in the year. And um, but we are holding our breaths uh, to hear about uh, a, a no, big NOAA grant that we applied for back in February. That should that happen should be um, could potentially be transformative for some of the things that we're able to accomplish as a, as a group. So I'm happy to entertain any questions. Any questions for Mark? Anyone uh, remote? Any questions? Yeah. yeah. Mark, can you give us a little bit more background on the NOAA grant? What was that fund? Um, <clears throat> I don't have the dollar amount in my head right now, but it's close to $2 million. That's right. Mm -hmm. it, it's like uh, 199 99 99 um, and it would be, uh, there's a fair amount of pass-through funding to partners in the region uh, that sort of prioritizes partnership and uh, especially environmental justice organizations. Um, we hope that we receive word about this and the funds actually come in prior to Congress, which is scheduled for November 15th, but we'll talk about it later, um, and can support some of our, uh, our partners across the region as well including our own capacities uh, to handle the partnership. So the grant really um, sort of foregrounds um, partnership to um, advance climate resilience uh, work in the region. So the Climate Action Plan for People and Nature in particular uh, process would benefit if we, if we get a plus positive side on that. Great. Great question. Any other questions about the report or anything else minutes on the consent agenda 
Otherwise, I'll take a motion to approve the consent agenda as <clears throat> presented. <laughs> okay, so I'll take a motion uh, from second. Emily and a second by Ted. Uh, any further discussion? There being none, all those in favor, motion by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Okay, consent agenda is approved unanimously. Um, we're next going to, uh, we did move things forward from maybe where you logged on earlier in the week of our agenda today, and we're going to go into our strategic advancement of our work streams with the GVI, the Green Vision Initiatives, um, and Ted Hafner, who is our GVI coordinator, um, will be going through all of that. Good morning, everybody. I am here under a, a couple of different capacities uh, that sort of intermingle with one another. This work started uh, with me as the, the head of the climate initiative um, and, and sort of continues uh, as a coordinator for the goal team initiatives. Um, next slide, please. So some of this may be familiar. Uh, a lot of this is lessons learned from the leadership of the goal initiative. But then my last few months uh, and first few months as the coordinator for the GBI leads. And, and this is uh, some strategies through conversations that we've had uh, looking for various goal team leads uh, or co-leads as support um, because we're finding capacity as an issue uh, as well as uh, some, some funding conversations and larger umbrella themes like climate, uh, water, um, and, and things like that. Uh, so this slide should not be uh, unfamiliar to you. It may be a bit outdated, but but um, really it, it talks about sort of the, the rejuvenation of Chicago wilderness into uh, a network of uh, partners, right? So uh, why, what, where, who, and how, uh, this was the foundation of moving from uh, the goal creation a couple of years ago and into action. Um, and, and we're really sort of approaching Chicago Wilderness as a network of partners that all share information, convene, and, and uh, scramble for resources, which um, that mindset has sort of been uh, really one of scarcity. And we're trying to actually not make it one of scarcity. Uh, because we have fantastic work and fantastic ideas and fantastic partner projects. And, and so what we're going to talk about today is what I've heard and, and some ways to sort of think about moving forward uh, through the discussion portion of this panel. Laura, next slide, please. Okay, so this uh, should may be unfamiliar to some of you, but I have actually showed this slide a number of times over the last couple of years. And uh, this came out of the goal creation for the climate initiative. Um, all teams were asked to create goals at the, during 2021, 2022, uh, for 2025, 2030. Um, this is my team's climate map that shows all of our goals here uh, for adaptation, mitigation, justice in community. So, uh, you know, community-based projects, things like that. Uh, advocacy and education. Uh, we have separate sub goals for each, but the main takeaway here is in analyzing these goals and creating these goals, we really depend on and, and need to interact with other teams to get these goals uh, accomplished. And, and so really with this slide, all I wanna show you is that climate touches everything. And through recent conversations, we're finding climate isn't alone in that discussion with water, ag, and virtually all of the goals. Um, so I just wanted to use this slide to, to sort of level set and ground everybody and how connected the work is and how, how I hope to uh, work with the coordinators or the, the, the initiative team leads to uh, move some of these excellent ideas forward. Any questions there? Hearing none, next slide, please. So um, with this, uh, I'm going to use the Climate Action for People in Nature project as an example of some of this high-level thinking. Um, so 
this came out of the goal initiatives and it's a really big lift the the climate action plan for people in nature there was a, a first effort done in the late 2000s it was fantastic um but it it sort of sat on a shelf and even though it was forward thinking and much of it's still relevant for today uh there were portions that need to drop away because they focused on like the carbon market at the chicago board of exchange which never really launched or it did for a year or two and then went away um so there was a whole sort of third of that report dedicated to that and that's not really relevant anymore um so it it, it became sort of front and center to revise this plan and and as we started thinking about the nature of the geography and the communities and the sectors in the places that we all live and play, we really realized we needed a different approach. And I'm going to go through that approach with you because I think it sort of mirrors how, how CWA writ large should be thinking about some of our work in general. Um, so this began uh, as a um, a project that was supported, the second effort, uh, that was supported by some very large and awesome partners of ours, uh, Nature Conservancy, the Field Museum, Morton Arboretum, and Open Lands. Um, and and uh, we really want to take the volunteer support from the goal teams to feed into this, as well as uh, communities in and around the region. Um, so we're looking, and the big pivot here is the first report was authored by heavies within CWA partnership, right? Um, we want to sort of tip that on its head and, and take it out to the public and, and get as many community co-authors as we can under the auspices that they know their communities the best, they know what they need. Uh, if we can bring them together holistically and collaboratively, then we can start to sort out some of these problems and direct the resources to the right places and, and the right communities that are most in need and most vulnerable to heat, flooding, air quality, that kind of thing. Um, so the, the, uh, the, open, the first seed funding uh, came from the partners listed, uh, and, and we're hoping to create this living document but we're still sort of figuring that out. Uh, next slide, please. So, oh yes, there's, and you see these waves that sort of overlap and intersect as they pop up on the screen. Uh, can we keep pushing those buttons to see what else happens? <laughs> Excellent. So it started in 2010, right? It sort of sat until recently, and then all of a sudden there's been a lot of energy uh, in these different waves from different communities, different sectors, different uh, areas of practice, if you will, from water to ag, uh, protection, maintenance, all the goal groups. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things that we're thinking is because it's such a complex thing, we need to think about how all these complexities overlap and really this diagram is a show of that. So, you know, we're thinking food, which is in our bailiwick. Um, now, climate change, certainly biodiversity is way in our bailiwick. Um, and then environmental justice, that's sort of new to us, uh, at least as a focus and a, a driver of this work. And really uh, it's all sort of knit together by public health, right? Fresh air, clean water, uh, all of that stuff and, and reducing a lot of the impacts that we see uh, through the heat and, and flooding that, that we are starting to experience, right? Um, I was just talking to a friend yesterday, <laughs> excuse me, where um, because of the change of the heat, he is having breathing problems. He's not asthmatic, but he is having like congestion problems going from hot to cold, hot to cold, hot to cold. And he went to his doctor, his doctor said, you're fine. I can give you antibiotics. He's like, no, 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 no if I'm fine. And he's like, it's the adjustment. It's right. We, this all impacts us. The, the storms from the last two days, downtown Cook County, um, Chicago, tornado warnings last three nights ago for two nights in a row. Um, twisters have touched down. They haven't, they're still doing the data analysis, but this is all a driver 
of, of the things that we're starting to face and and how how we deal with this as a community is really what we're I'm thinking and hearing is what we're all about. Next slide, please. So the main takeaway is what's different, this intersectional thinking, not that the first one wasn't intersectional thinking, but like I said, it focused on the carbon market, it focused on biodiversity, and really the primary focus was on land and conservation health, right? It left out all these other big, big pictures. And that's a shame because it's so all consuming that we really need these different voices, different understandings, right? to understand the impacts, what's going on in, in our region, to understand who's doing what so that we can most effectively shape and guide policies, resources, and efforts so that they don't overlap, right? It's a huge region and, and we need to understand it. So we have been listening. We still have a lot of listening and learning to do, but the main shift is intersectional thinking and inclusive of valuing the many different ways of thinking and knowing, right? And this isn't just ecological science-based, right? It is more social science that we want to bring in. It's also traditional ecological knowledge and indigenous knowledge and generations of knowledge that are passed down orally or through family traditions or community traditions that we haven't, as scientists, uh, focused on in the climate arena to date. So that's what's different this time. And that's what we hope to accomplish. And in my first three months as G C uh, G GBI coordinator, um, that's what I'm hearing is needed. The, the problem is now we need to make a bigger tent, right? And how do we do that? Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, you're going to have to click a bunch of times again. Keep going. And more. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so in 2023, we started convening um, under the auspices of this community-based work. Who should we be talking to? Who's doing what that's interesting? Uh, what do we need to learn? How do we relate to everybody in the geography uh, despite our different backgrounds, different approaches, different professions, right? Um, and, and then where we are now is sort of in this collaborative analysis and sort of systems thinking uh, work. And, and it all comes together sort of through this concept called a braided river. Next slide, please. Which looks something like this. And the idea here is, is that there's sort of this main body of thematic topics that get added to as tributaries come in, um, right? There are different parts of the system that may have independent operators or people that we don't know that we want to engage. Um, and, and we're taking this both as a concept for organization, but also as a way to drive the work forward in terms of timeline schedules and work streams. Um, so while this is sort of a figurative um, example and cartoon of what we hope to do, I think it's really elegant way to try to describe this sort of work in ways that at least we can understand and I think most people can understand because they understand rivers and flow of water and how things feed into and become bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, next slide, please. So what we have done to date um, is we have started listening. Uh, the Field Museum has been very instrumental in supporting this work, as have all those five main partners. But but now it's time to start branching out and, and doing the work and taking away from us and learning from everybody else so that it can be co-created. Uh, to that end, we have engaged uh, Seva Gandhi and her firm Collaborative Connections to help organize this work. And we are in conversations right now about who is missing from the table, brainstorming communities like there are 30 people in this meeting and we're putting post-its and who's inner circle who's outer circle who do we not know yet all of that um but but this is sort of zeva's work to date and these conversations are ongoing to try to activate and get out to the communities 
who is the audience that we really want to support because they're facing all of these impacts on the ground. And what we're finding is that because of the pandemic, there is so much more value and importance placed and interest placed on open space, communal gathering, um, as well as, you know, we recognize now that mature trees actually can provide a service for both flood relief, heat relief, uh, but our cities aren't designed that way. So how do we do that? How do we drive these things forward, whether it's trees, water, uh, protecting land, mapping, data, the whole kit and caboodle, right? So this is some of the thinking. And what Zeva is really trying to drive home is that alignment is key. And so um, what we've been doing over the past couple months is aligning ourselves to get on the same page before we go out to request uh, community uh, co-authorship and participation. But that is happening and it's moving forward. And, and I see this as sort of a microcosm of what CWA is trying to do writ large and, and what I'm trying to do with the GVI coordinators to move a lot of the excellent work forward, whether it's CWA based or whether it's partner based and, and deserves to be brought up and lifted up and supported. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to switch a little bit. It's still related, but uh, this is where we get into your question about the NOAA grant a little bit. Um, we applied to the grant about a year ago. It was a two round grant. The first round was a pretty heavy lift, but it was only a five page summary. Um, the second round was a much heavier lift. And I thought it was a really good example uh, of how CWA could come together to support regional work as Mark talked about to provide pass throughs, community support, as well as further our, uh, enabling the furtherance of our own thinking and efforts to coordinate and move all of the goal teamwork forward. Um, there is stuff in there that touches pretty much every team, potentially, if we get that grant, um, in communal style, right? So one of the things that, that we have found is there's still a lot of healing that needs to go on racially in order to even have these conversations and come together in the first place. That's a component of it. Um, what we're thinking about with the cap end and moving that forward is, is these community workshops, right? There's money to hold these community workshops because you need to rent a facility, you need to provide good food to get people there um, and all of that. So one of the efforts here was to actually map who the CWA partners were and what their sector is. And I actually beg, stole, and borrowed this idea from the excellent work of Goal Team 3, the Rights Away group. They had a, they mapped their own partnership to understand who their constituency was. And I thought that was a really good idea and brought it to the next level. And this is our Goal Team map, as well as some lessons learned from the NOAA grant, um, which I think is part of this conversation moving forward as we work to coalesce. Um, and, and provide facilitation and, and uh, collaboration in the, in the geography uh, and with the partnerships. So the main thing is we learned that we need to understand the grant and the materials required. Uh, I wouldn't say that we didn't have experience, but it was a heavy lift because we were kind of naive in that respect. Uh, we could have been a lot more focused going into it, even though I thought we did really, really fantastic work we sort of did that in the process and that was not ideal. Um, alignment uh, of the ideas to the grant is great, right? Uh, part of the problem is grants are so complex these days that you don't know how you fit in or even if you're eligible, right? So having an understanding of that is key. Question? Yeah, uh, out of ignorance, the, the map itself, my presumption is the, the, the big dot is the issue or concern this and is little dots around it are the organizations that are heavily focused on that issue or concern. Is that so? It, you're almost right, and we haven't gotten there yet. This is just Chicago Wilderness is the blue dot, and then the different sectors are different colors. Sorry, 
Um, so yellow is the public utility partnerships. Uh, green is the governmental uh, sector partnerships from federal to county to local. Um, red is... Uh, so the central that isn't the issue, it's just a... It, this guess. is a, a partner map of the alliance to understand who we had, what sectors there were, so that we could go out to gain uh, support for this communal thinking and idea, right? Who do we need to, to think about? How do we do it? And who do, who, what partnerships are important to this right now? Does, and, and I think the next step is to take this and organize it then by issue and who might play in that sandbox, if that makes sense. Other questions since we're at a stopping point? Nope, okay. Um, so the other thing, that we learned was we had a, a loose understanding of what we wanted to do, but not a great idea of the partnerships, the budgets, um, scope, scale, uh, and all of that, right? Very practical considerations that any funder would want to know. We had great notions about that, but when it came to sitting down and saying, okay, who gets what and how are we actually going to leverage this for activation, we needed to do a lot of deeper thinking that we kind of were prepared for, but again, it kind of got made up along the way the best we could. Um, and then what we also found is that we have to understand the intangibles. Uh, what are the justice 40 communities that the federal government is really putting a lot of their uh, efforts and, and focus on to include so that these resources actually hit the ground in the right way? Uh, any federal grant these days and most state grants because they're following the federal leads um, are are requiring uh, like a 40 or 48% of the, the project scope to be going towards those communities. Um, they're emphasizing now very much like our thinking, uh, partnership and co-creation, right? That was great for us to learn because it shows that our thinking was actually right on the right path. It's just really difficult to do. Um, the other thing we found, and this is not, rocket science to anybody that's written grants is, is to move multiple uh, initiatives forward with one idea, right? Um, emphasize the, the many benefits that go into this with one effort and, and how we can solve problems like that. Um, and then uh, we have a created and talented writing team that thinks that we have a couple more of these big scale NOAA type grants in us, which is fantastic. Because as a coordinator, um, even if we're successful with no or not, we're going to do this stuff. But I'd like to actually take this learning and apply it to other goal team initiatives, whether it's prescribed fire, whether it's agriculture and community connections, whether it's land protection, water, uh, and the like. Um, so those are some of the lessons learned that are in the back of my mind as I think about coordination and as we think about how CWA should move forward with its work and resource allocation and support for partners and moving this network forward. Uh, next slide, please. So what are some of the tools that we have? We have a grants project and tracking spreadsheet. We have had this grants project and tracking spreadsheet for a year and a half now. Very few people have gone in and actually put their ideas into it uh, for various reasons. Capacity is one of them. Maybe institutionalization of this tool is another. Um, the third is maybe competition instead of cooperation, right? We all work for our own organizations. They have their own interests. And maybe there's some cooperation issues that we have <laughs> in, in this environment, right? So what I'm hoping to do is instead of releasing this sheet to the world to have everybody fill in with their great ideas, which is still open to do, uh, I am now as part of that coordination effort, the one that is mostly playing in this spreadsheet. And through conversations that I have with all the goal team, through conversations I have with people I meet, I say, wow. That's a great idea. I'm putting that in this sheet and I will put a little summary and then I might go back to the person who had that initial idea and said, hey, we think there's momentum here. We think this is a good idea. Can we build this out? 
right? That's my aim and that's my hope. So that's one tool that we have at our disposal. And that's one tab of that tool. The other tab is uh, an ongoing and uh, pretty well updated list of federal, state, and foundational grants um, that we come across or our partners come across and share with us. Some of this is redundant, but um, we really want to support our partners by providing these resources so that you can know what opportunities are coming up, read through the grants that are linked, uh, and understand to apply some of the lessons learned that I gave earlier, right? For scoping, uh, partners, um, letters of support, that kind of thing. Uh, recently, uh, I was not even with an email message sent a spreadsheet of a very similar list, but I like that list because it's thinking at the very local level. It has local businesses that have grants. The Open Lands uh, grant is in there. The, the ComEd Green Region Open Lands Partnership grant is in there, right? Um, I think that might be in ours too, but that's the kind of sort of level that we're talking about that we don't really get at because we're looking up and um, sort of out, whereas this list looks like inward and around, if that makes sense. So uh, that's something that I'm working to try to understand and fold in as part of the work. Um, and then we have had for the past year and a half also an ad hoc grant committee uh, standing meeting every Thursday at like 9.30, 10 a.m. I can't remember the time, but it's around there uh, on the second or third Thursdays of the month. And uh, this is a group that has recognized the need to support partners, identify opportunities, both for CWA institutional health, but other quality projects in and around the region. Uh, the change in this ad hoc uh, notion is because what we're realizing is it's not, it, this effort shouldn't just be about grants because even though grants are very helpful, they're not a great efficient use of time. They're a really heavy lift. They take a lot of time, thought, and energy, and they're really hard to do. So if we can think about development writ large and funding conversations from private philanthropy, other interested parties, that's the pivot that we're thinking of in this group. And it's like underway right now. Um, so that's part of the learnings and conversation. Uh, but the main takeaway here is the tools are only as sound as the cooperative nature of the organization uh, of the network and partnership, right? Uh, and based on listening sessions and works to date, uh, we see there is both opportunity and need for coordination, communication, and collaboration around the funding uh, at this historic moment. And we're attempting to take all of this and lean into it, right? That's the important takeaway uh, because I think we're all busy. We have a propensity to kind of silo ourselves or reach out to known entities, but we're really trying to crack that egg, break that mold. We'll use whatever uh, example you want there, uh, metaphor, and go outward to support uh, the region writ large. Uh, next slide, please. So um, what are the recommendations and what are we thinking of as Part of this grant organization is key. We talked about the spreadsheet. We talked about the lessons learned in our own NOAA grant applications. Um, wait, did I, oh, this is in here twice. Can we just skip this? Thanks. Sorry. Um, so that's sort of where I am at, at after the first couple months of being thrown into this formal role. Um, and, and really, it's I think frames part of the budget discussion coming up next. Some of the the procedures, conversations that were coming up next, but but it's really a high level strategy of how do we all come together? How do we facilitate to really support our community partners and make a difference with the impacts we're facing due to our changing climate, which we are seeing different ways every day as we've seen this week and this year and the last five, 10, 15 years. Uh, Thanks, questions before we launch into the discussion. I'm happy to take them. Uh, but I, you know, I wanted to sort of use this opportunity to, to level set, hear what I've heard over the last few months and, and give some thoughts about moving forward through conversations that you know, Elizabeth had been part of, uh, Laura, Mark, and many of you at the, the table here and, and on the screen. Yes, sir. 
and I, I like the work you've done, and it's, it's really very fundamental what we need to do here. But um, how do you see the role of government in, in your network team? I, I saw some some slides points out to the left, and as a elected official, I can tell you there's there's profound need for us to connect outside of our silos, which is you know. It's a, it's a kind of a small world, but we need to be working with groups in this room. And we have worked with Open Lands and got a great relationship thus far. We need to work with more than. And I like your idea of the spreadsheet. I was just doing this yesterday, referring to nonprofits to a, a source that is sort of a, a listing of federal grants. So, you know, having been to Washington and done lobbying, I can tell you that there's a lot out there still. I mean, when the IRA first came out, there were like 200, 300 grand opportunities, but they were all with like separate departments and separate applications. Right. <laughs> and so, in government, we have kind of a competitive advantage because we have grant writers, we have lobbyists, we have access to these people, but still. Okay. It's a lot. It is a lot. And I'm going to answer, try to answer your question in a couple of different ways through a couple of the different hats that I wear in addition to this one. Um, I too have been to Washington over the past decade several times to lobby for conservation causes and climate change resilience, right? Um, through various organizations. Since the pandemic, I have witnessed a, a shift in those conversations and the reception of our group. Before we go, I'd be glad handing, oh, nice to see you. I love my parks. I love I, I love conservancies, right? They wouldn't even get the names right. Now they're like, oh, you have data, you have ideas, let's sit down and talk. So first of all, there needs to be a shift in willingness. And I think that shift is underway slowly, but there is a shift, at least at the federal level. Uh, that I've seen, and and I've been to Springfield a couple times. That's even crazier. I don't know about that yet. Um, so that's one answer: is the opportunity and availability to have these conversations received, right? Um, and I think that's switching, and that's an opportunity, and and that's a great one. Um, number two, there are um, we have a we have a, a, a CWA. Uh, a governance committee, not a governance committee, but a what, what, advocacy. advocacy committee. They send out alerts um, that any partner can submit to the whole network with, you know, the standard write-up of contact your local official, here's a template, or here's what we've said, revise it as you see fit, right, for this issue. Um, we use that often. Anytime a partner wants it, they can fill that out and it gets at, sent to the all the partners in the network, right? So that's a tool that we have at our disposal, and that's a pretty effective one that we use probably not often enough, but we use when we can um, both internally and externally. So number two. Number three, uh, we're going to start getting into the weeds of the goal initiatives per se. So um, we have that a member of that group on the climate committee. So she looks out for our actions as in her day hat at TNC, right? Because she's on their GR committee and she does this as her job. So she does it for TNC, but she also does it for Chicago Wilderness as well. And that's how we talk. Um, there are a couple other folks on that committee that operate the same way. So, so that's a threading connection. Uh, but really through the goal teams, I'm finding that through ag, there's a big policy um, opportunity, and and here's big news here. Uh, thanks to Tim's work as the head of the Ag Committee or co-lead with Dan Daniel Soares, um, they launched this idea of having a couple workshops for Will County on Will County quality of life uh, for small uh, agricultural owners and operators, right? Uh, this has been small conversations, town hall meetings over the past couple of years. Uh, two weeks ago, the Will County Board approved a resolution for this Good Food for All program that came out of these workshops. That then went to the NACO meeting, and the NACO is the National Association of Counties. So you heard it, it passed, right? Okay, it did. We heard that Friday, 
Now, I got an email yesterday that the lieutenant governor, based on this effort, is interested at in coming to the table now. So that's how we hope to leverage this through the goal groups. It's multi-efforted, multi-pronged. We haven't even gotten into IC yet, uh, right, Sergio? So um, there are opportunities there. I just, right, it is, it's multi-pronged and complex, but these are some of the ways that we're thinking. Now, there's the whole other aspect of the lessons learned when we went out for the NOAA grant that uh, letters of support from elected representatives are hugely beneficial to an application, right? So that's an opportunity that we were able to cobble together two or three of those. But if you can get to a state rep or your uh, congressional federal representative, that's a big opportunity to have these conversations and move this forward and break down some of those silos that you're talking about. And, and hopefully, you know, that's some of the stuff that we're gonna put in place as we educate, come together and share these lessons learned and then help support other people because we write letters of support, right? We can help say, oh boy, have you thought of letters of support from this person? Can we reach out and provide a contact for your conduit? Can we help set up a meeting to facilitate this idea with this representative or that connection or, you know, so it's slow, but that's how, how I hope to take what we've learned over the past couple of years and institutionalize it moving forward. Does that answer your question? I'm sure I'm missing a lot and I'd love to further this conversation with you, but. I think just we're having a discussion about creating this linkage is a very positive thing because, you know, as, as a government official, I want to work with this other organization sure. to leverage our lobbying power. And you're absolutely right about the letters of support. We, we were able to get some letters of support for uh, transportation project, and without it, it wouldn't have happened. We were awarded this huge $19 million grant, and we were only one of two entities in Illinois that qualified for it. So, having letters of support requires a lot more organization of all the stakeholders, if you will. But, you know, making the connections and being all part of the network is, is a powerful. And that's what ties us back to that grant tracking list. If we can have projects that are sort of pre-baked and partners that are pre-baked and a, a, a map of how to capitalize on opportunities as they roll out, that makes that grant writing team's work much easier and we don't have to sort of learn along the way as much as we did, right? right? Right. No, terrific. And Ted, thank you for your leadership and all of our GVI leads. And I'm just curious with the timing that we have. Anyone that's remote that had any particular ads to the discussion or anybody else in the room as well, Abigail. Anyone online? Okay, Abigail, please. For those online, Abigail was uh, uh, highlighting the the opportunity to work through uh, networks that that are coalitions of governments like the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus. Um, I'm also doing that with uh, a, a group of through the climate committee with a group of, of folks in Western Cook County that are small villages uh, that have 14 mayors and they have a strong coalition. They don't know how to use their power yet. Um, so that's another opportunity. Any other questions other before I turn it back to Elizabeth? Uh, I think there's a getting our word out more. I think we should get a chapter in project 2025. Which is pretty, pretty popular these days. So all kidding aside. <laughs> In a press. Um, the, so the joke there for those online was that we should, never mind. <laughs> um, that's probably a discussion for another time. I struggle with the environmental justice piece in that, what do we want to do with that? You know, because, I mean, look at our committee, right? Just on, a, on the face of it, you know, um, God bless us all. But, um, you know, is it education? Is it board members from those communities? Because you know, we're we're kind of primed for it, but I don't know how it how how I don't have it in my head how that 
how that happened? Well, I think it's an evolution. I think that's been part of our journey in education with our Jedi work and all the training teams. And so we're seeing um, within the organizations, they're shifting, um, providing space that's comfortable and in these shared agreements, I think is key. It's welcoming and inviting in, but it's not, we learned right away early on that we just can't assign someone and, and do that. It has to naturally feel comfortable. And over time, hopefully within our GVI working groups at the entry level, there is an opportunity, although at the head of organizations, that's changing too. And them being that this is the place to be and their voices will be respected and heard. And so um, I think it's a journey, but we can't say, yes, we're going to, you know, we're not making quotas and we're not talking about window dressing. We're talking, it's a time process. So to answer your question a little bit further, Vinny, part of my thought in this is mentorship and succession planning. And uh, somehow integrating that into the co-authorship and co-creation, right? As we get to understand each other and learn from each other, then we can actually hope to engage each other in each other's work and implement a lot of the educations and fill some of the gaps and barriers that we know exist in this room and the organization. Does that help? Yeah. I mean, it's slow, slow going, right. but um, that is very much part of my thinking as I work to coordinate these goal groups. Hey, Cynthia. Yeah, I was going to just jump with that and say that because you're a coalition of organizations, like we are, you know, statewide, it's really all of those other groups that are all working on that similar, you know, patient process of community engagement and bringing people together looking outward, looking inward. So you can only reflect as best you can what everyone else around you and in the coalition are doing. And if we're all doing this work patiently and intentionally, it will happen. And I agree with that it takes time because um, you can't snap your finger and, and change our society, but we all have to, we're all working on that. And that will be reflected at that coalition level. Yeah, thank you. Great, great, Cynthia. Pace and speed of trust, right? Patience, persistence, and and then continuing on the welcoming environment. So, um, great discussion. Again, thank you, Ted, thank for you, your everybody. leadership. Um, again, encourage the going out to the hub, which is through the Chicago Wilderness Alliance's website, where you can see each of the GVIs. It has their goals, and so as we look towards this, and just to underscore. There's a lot of wonderful activity that's happening within the four states. And so with the partners that are developed, whether formally through the alliance, but having this green vision allows groups to come together and see themselves under the umbrella and under the tent and then to connect with us. And there's a lot going on. And I think just bringing those voices forward, um, we can. And there's a lot being achieved, a lot of success stories to, to talk about. All right, I'm going to shift now uh, just for our policies and procedures discussion. And this has been a conversation that has been held by the steering committee. Really important because the last time that we reviewed and brought uh, and changes forward on our policies and procedures was back in 2022. We had updated this when we went to the new 2.0 CWA. And there's been a lot that's uh, gone on since that time period. Um, just to reformat with these documents, we had uh, worked with PCI as our communications consultant to redo our branding and really position the alliance of who we are and how are we going to promote to our primary audience, secondary audiences. And so that had not been captured in this, uh, as well as the importance as we've grown as an executive council and different roles and responsibilities that everybody understands how we've changed, but what is the opportunity and what does it mean to be a partner of the Alliance and what are those shared expectations a little bit further so that we can do this great work that we all want to embark on. And I wanna give a shout out in Victoria, if anything on the slides that I have, she had assisted as well, um, kind of lay these out. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, Laura, please, or Lake. There's a delay. Okay, on um, our purpose, uh, again, we understand why we're here together and we are to bring a coalition of partners together to implement the mission of Chicago Wilderness Alliance. And we know that we're within a four state uh, region here on a large landscape efforts across Southern shores of Lake Michigan. 
Um, and so this is uh, our work. And so that purpose is stated within the document. Next. So we do regional scale work. Our mission, uh, very clear and succinct that we're a regional collaborative of hundreds of partner organizations and individuals working to implement landscape scale approaches to conservation in and around the southern shores of Lake Michigan, including members from Southeast Wisconsin, Northeast Illinois, Northwest Indiana, and Southwest Michigan. We bring leaders, experts, mid and young career conservation professionals together from all sectors of the membership footprint to share diverse voices, perspectives, and work towards a common goal, creating and protecting a vibrant, accessible region where people and nature thrive. So that's been our mission. We adopted that, and that's not changing. Uh, next. Our green vision. Sorry, this is a delay on my screen here. Um, and so this is our vision. Our vision, which we've been talking about, is our seven initiatives um, that we are working towards. And then, of course, our hub that connects us all together. So this is our focus, and this is what the Alliance has been working on. And so there's no proposed changes there as far as what has been identified next. Okay, on this, I wanna just highlight uh, in brief, and this may be difficult for you to, to see there, but it is available and it is in the policy document that everybody should have had um, to review and that is available. And what we're doing today is uh, a first reading for discussion. So we're not approving any amendments today, but I want you to, Take this back to your organization, be contemplative, have discussions. If there's areas to which you want to provide feedback to, then be able to do so. And then we will bring this document hopefully back in October and have it amended to reflect how we want the council to be. But as executive council members, first and foremost is attendance at these meetings quarterly. We meet four times a year. Um, we have shifted during COVID into a hybrid or online version um, of the meetings. And like today, we're doing home and together um, where we used to always come together in person. Um, so one of the commitments is that you provide yourself or a delegate to be present with your partner organization and you're leaning in to help. Um, we also look that you're reviewing um, our Alliance's purpose, mission, and green vision, and if some adjustments need to be made, that you speak that out to the group and that we're able to modify. Um, the Executive Council, you set the strategic focus of the Alliance in our direction. I mean, that's our purpose. We do this together. And then you implement the strategies of the Alliance. So it's not an assignment. We are fortunate enough to have a managing director Laura Riley, who's been guiding, and we've hired on Lake and Maria doing our consulting, but our work, you know, our implementation is due to the strength of our partners. And really, we've identified the importance of getting the executive directors, the CEOs, the presidents of the organizations to roll up their sleeves and make it part of their team's work plan to, this is important. If this is important, then we need to have everybody participating to implement. And then uh, determining the objectives, our annual operations plan of how resource, that is something that this group as a body is expected to do. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, executive council, this body is the governance body. And so you are approving the leadership of existing teams, co-leads, um, that is a responsibility. Um, admitting new partners like we did today, you voted on our new executive council members to be part of our work. Um, you develop key strategies with external relationships, as you saw the bapping of who we need to be reaching out to and connecting. And then accepting the reports that are coming from the Green Vision teams, our corporate council, or standing other administrative groups. Um, this group receives all those reports and it's kind of the pass through here um, from this group. And then also, this body is the responsible body for our branding of our, our, our logo and how it's used and how we approve and work with our sponsors. Next slide, please. Um, at the October meeting, you're gonna hear about our budget shortly, but one of the roles is to approve our, our project budget, our annual operating budget and any grants that we are pursuing. Um, a role is to monitor our projects and to task how we're doing and achieving our goals and holding all of ourselves accountable towards that. Um, and then one of the other areas, we have our awards committee, the George B. Rad Force of Nature Awards and the Excellence in Ecological Restoration Program. And the executive council does review what is submitted and approve those 
designations uh, for acknowledgement and recognition. Setting policies of operational guidelines through reviewing our policies and procedures document, because this is the group that has to amend those, those procedures. And then accepting the treasurer's report. We had that on the consent agenda today so that we're financially sound and in good standing. Um, next slide, please. The approval of our council meetings when we come together. That's the responsibility of this body. And then <laughs> authorizing any agreements that we extend forward that's part of our budget um, before we enter into something like that. That goes to this group to be able to authorize to do that. We follow Robert's rules of order as our parliamentary procedures. And then this group elects your officers of the executive council, which is the chair, the vice chair, the secretary, and then between five to 12 at large steering committee members. And the steering committee represents the executive board of the executive council. Okay. So really in standing, that is, that is, there's no changes that have been made to that. Those are the roles that the executive council has. But we want to make sure that it's not a small group of partners that are facilitating all of this, that that bringing together those four times a year, this is where we do the work and the business of the of the Chicago Wilderness Alliance. And then as the committee we do their work, um, it, it comes all together, it folds back into to this group. Okay, so really important that you're here and glad that you are. Any questions about that? All right, we do have existing standing committees, and these committees have not changed with the exception of the Green Vision Initiative Coordinating Group. We used to have a coordinating council now with uh, Ted's leadership and the GBI co-leads coming together. That kind of has assumed what used to be, and so that's helping task to make sure that we're working towards our goals. Um, some of these groups, for example, the um, development committee, we have a grants committee. It really is the development committee. That's the group that's doing that. Some of these, we do not have leadership um, championing this, and it's our goal to align a steering committee member to be an accountable person, but also we're looking for leadership to step up and help us guide um, some of these initiatives. Um, some are in good hands. But uh, for example, a communications committee, that has been one with Maria, Laura, and Lake, uh, and then others from our organizations. We could really tap into some communication professionals within your organizations that would be willing to help drive our messaging and take PCI left us a lot of recommendations. We just have not been able to move them forward mm -hmm. in their full breadth because of just capacity. Yes. Question. The Excellence in Ecological Restoration Commission, is that a, I guess I'll say, with another term for it being uh, best or beneficial management practices, is that the, the purpose of that group? So there is an accreditation, uh, site accreditation program um, that goes out to particular sites and evaluates where an organization, where a land, a large land holding has, a, you know, best management practices put into practice. And this commission goes out, they do a site review, and then they honor either four levels, platinum, you know, bronze, gold, I got an olive or silver, the four, four levels of commitment, and then that's awarded. And then that site is designated, designated by Chicago Wilderness Alliance. And so there are uh, individual representation that that's an active group um, we'd love to see more organizations get their sites accredited with this branding because um, it reflects back into our gbi work it reflects back into our biodiversity plan all the great work um, so yes best management practices all right next slide please and then the partnership committee i just bring that on that's a really important group that used to be the membership committee but helping as we get new partners involved, this is a group to welcome them, get them. It's hard to learn about the Alliance and how complex we are and to make a group feel warm and welcome. So with our new partners that joined us, Laura does a great job, but we could definitely use a welcoming committee that would help get them onboarded and, and hit the ground running. Um, lastly, there are four officer positions here and there are specific roles in the policies of what these individuals in these positions do. Um, and uh, these are the four officers that represent the executive committee of the executive board. Um, but we have certain tasks because we have one full-time team member. Um, we end up having to do a lot of back office type of work to, to steer the organization and keep us moving forward. So, um, and these are defined, really no changes that have been made here, um, but it just clarifies what each role is responsible for, okay. 
Next slide, please. And then at large steering committee members, um, they help to coordinate as well. They provide leadership and helping us advance these initiatives. They act as liaisons to the different committees and help champion and to, to be a representation of, of the Alliance going forward. So there's no changes there beyond the upgrade does have us including up to 12 steering committee members for that. Uh, next slide, please. And um, two areas that we did modify last time was a difference between general partners and executive council partners. One of the things that we learned was the barriers of participation where we do have a suggested uh, partnership contribution level, but at no time is any organization um, denied being involved with the Alliance for not ability to pay. So we've eliminated those barriers. However, at the general partner level, the expectations, I guess the difference just in contrast, we still are engaging, they're invited to be involved with our working teams, they're invited to come to these meetings. But when we're an executive council partner, we're gonna increase a little bit, not necessarily the ability to pay, um, but your contributions. The expectation is your organization is helping to advance these initiatives forward. Your attendance at these meetings, you're helping to lead the movement. So you're taking a more actively involved to be part of the body that's, that's shaping this organization, right? So it's really, there is a difference there. And it's great to see so many partners at executive council. And so our focus is really that we wanna make sure that those executives of organizations, <laughs> that they're sending delegates, that they're present, because we have a lot of partners, but sometimes at these council meetings, we've seen a little bit just based on time and priorities, it dwindling. And we wanna put the focus in and set these meetings up so that it's engaging, your time is valuable, but your time present is really important. And I think those individual partnership relationships that have been made will help foster these new projects and initiatives and, and keep things going. All right, we also on here discussed term limits. Um, so that was an open discussion, but I guess I would just open the floor on this. If there were any areas of concern, any uh, discussionable mm -hmm. items that anybody would like to bring forward for first reading that we should take under consideration. Most of it was clean up of just adding the PCI language. Victoria, anything else on your end? Yes, um, you read my mind. I do have something. Um, this is fantastic, Elizabeth. Thank you for breaking this down into these um, very clear and concise slides. And I'm just curious if we could make these available to uh, the Alliance on our website or and also in our newsletter. Um, so that those who weren't able to attend today have access to them. And with respect to, you know, a partnership committee that has a welcoming committee or a communications committee component, um, perhaps this could be part of that welcome package. Um, I just, I really appreciate the work that you've put into um, creating these slides. They're very clear, concise, and I think will be super helpful for folks that are newer to the Alliance to understand you know, the roles and responsibilities of executive council partners as compared to general partners. So thank you. Thank you, Victoria. All right, anyone else? I, I just want to say this is so helpful because I'm sitting here and I don't know who I am. <laughs> and now I do. You. <laughs> <laughs> Bingo, all right. I haven't been talking because not, I didn't think I was executive. So this is very helpful. I'm general. I now know who I am and I know what I would need to do if I'm going to be executive council. Right. And we want to encourage everybody to come and be part of the council and to, to be part of this. And again, yeah. we're welcoming everyone. We even went to where now individuals can be part of the alliance. You don't have to be part of a partner organization. But if we're going to build this coalition, as you know, it takes a lot of energy. All right, next slide. So we will consider, can I just, uh, I guess maybe for process from council, I need a motion to accept just first reading on the policy, and then we'll bring it back with any changes in October at our second uh, next council meeting. Thank you, Emily. We have a motion to accept and mark second. Any further discussion? 
All right, this is still a working draft. Take it back to organizations and give feedback. I'm going to turn it over to Mark now, and he's going to highlight our budget, which is the other item Executive Council needs to focus on. Um, well, happy to be of assistance. And uh, go ahead, Vince. Oh, we did oh you know, thank we you, Robert. It. Thank you so much here. Yes, thank you. I'm going next thing here. Thank you. So all those in favor, motion by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. I feel better. Thank you. You have to Good. keep me in check because I get so excited. I'm ready to move out to the next. Not the, uh, so, thank that's you. Us. Um, so I, I'll, I'll try to be brief. This is also kind of a first reading of the budget. Um, we'll do formal approval in October at our meeting then. But this is to kind of create the sort of general outlines of where we where we stand and how we're thinking about things as uh, you know we plan the year. Um, this is just a one page summary. I have there's more detailed notes in your uh, packet for the meeting today that I could speak to if you'd like. Um, I would just point to a couple of key things. Um, note that, well, first of all, before I, I used the figure, we're currently at $487,000 in net assets, but we were really budgeting towards 384 this year. And we will be, and as I said, the, the big hit of income came at the beginning of the year, and we're kind of working that through. And notice that we're projecting a budget of 306000 so that's uh, it's a decrease, but we have not yet built into this. Uh, we don't know if we get that NOAA grant or not, um, and that will, as I said, has some transformative impact, much of which will, will go towards if we if we get it towards program, if you look at the expenditures down here, uh, two hundred four thousand this year, down to one hundred six thousand next year. If we don't get the NOAA grant, and uh, and we tried to build into the thinking as Ted was saying before around that NOAA uh, uh, proposal, um, to not have scarcity thinking govern how we think about things. So that's that's a uh, a large point to make here. Um, one thing to note also is on the revenue side um, that this year budgeting 72,000 in sponsorship and that goes down to 11,000 this year and we'll hear about this in a second is the Congress. And so we build that into our thinking for uh, events and how that uh, affects income and expenses uh, in a given year. Um, <clears throat> the uh, other than that, a couple of things just to point to down in here. Um, the contractor line goes up a bit. And in general, we're really trying to put resources towards the operate the the helping having the alliance uh, work and function for everybody. Um, the amazing job that Laura does, uh, assisted now on the on the um, uh, call is uh, Lake as well. Uh, we get we are very well served by Maria Sadowski and, and marketing assistants. We also are very well served by friends of the Forest Preserve, Cook County Forest Preserves, who are our fiscal agent. Um, so this represents a, a modest increase. And we also, I think everybody should know that we are. Uh, we have set aside and invested in the work that Ted is doing and in the work that each of the leads of each of those um, goal teams uh, takes up. That there are uh, stipends are set aside for the leadership role on those teams. We know that that um, that can be wearing work at some time at points and in the difficult, challenging work, uh, but rewarding work of building partnership. We want to make sure that those investments are are represented. So that, that's the basic outline. I, I just thought I would also just say, just generally speaking, should the NOAA work be funded, you can expect to see that we would be able to invest in a lot of the climate action plan for people in nature, including uh, some of the work of tribes and community organizations. Um, we would be making some significant investments in the, in the hub. Um, which is our geospatial um, 
work that undergirds and tracks and supports the work of each of the goal teams. The um, we would probably see some. Uh, we've we've set aside funds for uh, development of our, our further work on uh, uh, Jedi justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, including a bilingual communications coordinator. Um, so we, we're, we're really seeking to make those investments and, and seeking the funds to do that, but we, at the moment, don't have the funds to budget it. I'm hoping that between now and the end of October, we'll have a, 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 a different number at the bottom here, but um, that's, that's where we stand now, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, I'll right. roll on. Any questions uh, for those remote? <laughs> Okay, with that, so are you going to take a motion to move the treasure, uh, the proposed budget, Mark, the yeah. treasure? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Do I have a second? Second by Vince. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Uh, motion oh, by Vince. Yeah. Wonderful. So this Great, is, again, you. that is draft. You'll see it again. We hope to see changes. But the key pieces we're mapping, uh, and not to, uh, to to go over, to emphasize, but there is an annual investment that CW is making with our fund reserves. It's going back into the programs. Yeah. We're going back out to our partners to lead a lot of great things that you're going to hear about. And um, we are very well and sustainable in our partners, and, and we have a big vision to accomplish a lot. That's why those grants are really key. And um, it's exciting times uh, for that. All right, so, which is a big project here. So I'm gonna turn to Victoria to talk about Congress. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, yes, we have our biannual conference, which is um, our Congress happening on Friday, November 15th at per Purdue University Northwest's Hammond campus in Northwest Indiana and have a suite of committees that have been working really hard behind the scenes on a number of fronts. One of those is simply planning the day of the, of the event. Another is soliciting and reviewing proposals that were submitted to populate the content during the day. There's also a team focused on ensuring the welcome and introduction during the plenary session is captivating, inspiring, and builds energy and momentum for the day. Um, in addition, we're working on field trips, companion field trips that will take place the day before Congress on November 14th. Um, currently in development are two bus tours, one of conservation areas in Northwest Indiana and another of the Calumet Lakes areas in Southeast Illinois or Southeast Chicagoland, pardon me. Um, and yes, we are um, building this all on the theme of Stronger Together. Our Chicago Wilderness Alliance region is more resilient through the strong partnerships that we have. And so that's our spotlight. Um, we're also making an effort to put a spotlight on the incredible work that's been undertaken in the Calumet region of the Alliance footprint um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but I'll stop there and maybe hand it over to Laura or Mark who may want to fill in additional information or expound upon our theme and efforts. Okay, uh, yeah, so we were thrilled to receive 56 proposals for review and we had four outstanding review teams, uh, which included Victoria Wittig, Chris Krause, Grace Chafoya, um, Brett Park, Kathleen Mueller, Aaron Argelin, Katie Hopgood, Valerie Messentier, I think I that right, yeah. uh, Leslie Thompson, Ted Hafner, Laura Dirks, and Maya Etienne. And so I want to thank that review team because they have been instrumental in helping us really map out and plan uh, the day. Letters of um, the final proposals will be under review by that team, and we will hope to get the notifications out in the next two weeks. And um, Plenary planning is underway and registration is set to open early August. So I also um, want to invite anyone who is interested in um, supporting the day as a sponsor 
your sponsorship will go towards helping to underwrite the cost of the day, as well as keep our uh, cost of a ticket low and to fund the scholarships for the day for those who can attend from all of your institutions. And with those funding levels, there yeah. are a number of uh, complimentary tickets that are associated with that. So you can use that to invite your staff, your board members, your volunteers, and um, at a certain level above, there are tabling opportunities that are associated with that at a thousand and above. So um, if you want more information about that, I think the things dropped in the chat, there's links in the packet, but also you can talk to me about that. So thank you. Thank you, Laura. All right, next slide, please. Oh, this is um, this was a quick look at that. So yeah. um, here's our sponsor slide. Uh, we want to thank uh, Res, the Wetlands Initiative, and the Forest Reserve in Page County, who have already joined us. Thank you very much. We're thrilled about that. And if you'd like to serve on the planning committee, there are still a lot of exciting details to be worked out. So um, please contact me. Our next meeting is tomorrow at 2 p.m. No, yes, 2 p.m. Oh, so yeah, I would be happy to send an invite to you to join us it's via Zoom. And uh, here's more information on the day. Uh, and okay. Yeah, and it's really incredible um, to see just to underscore that that um, twice as many session proposals as opportunities uh, in the schedule. So we're really kind of figure out how to how to incorporate as many of those voices as we can maybe maybe needing a couple of adjustments to sessions and things like that but um the level of interest is super high and uh to some of the points that have been raised today about engagements different kinds of partnerships with different kinds of entities especially the communities environmental justice communities in the climate region um i think um We've got a lot to learn and can do it together, which is the theme of the conference. Yeah. Yeah. And Purdue Calumet is about uh, a millimeter across the state line into Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Actually, it's a fantastic venue. It's a wonderful, venue and, it's a nice wonderful venue, and they've yeah, right. and it's going to be a really, great. really good place to be. It's going to be a good, a good, a good event. Uh, with us. some uh, field trips underway uh, that are surrounding the event as well. Yeah, it's just for one day. One day, yes. Uh, yes. One day. One day. The one field day. trips are being slated for the day before, so those are being slated for Thursday, and um, the conference itself is Friday. But all good and and wonderful. Thank you for the planning committee on this, and anyone that's wanting to get involved, there'll be opportunities to do so. Um, so before we go into what's up on the horizon here for the alliance, because there's an, again a lot of great things happening, just to call out here for nominations uh, to be on the steering committee. We went over kind of the guidelines. You have that in the document of your policies and procedures. So if you want to get more familiar, but we would love to have new voices and individuals of their organizations joining us. So there is a nomination that will be online. Um, and then from there, it goes back and it'll be vetted. And uh, again, a, a slate to be able to be put forth um, at the October meeting uh, with terms to begin uh, in January. So be thinking of someone um, that you believe would be great to be part of the organization. Yeah, and, and all of those that have been received the date will be re reviewed. Reviewed again. again. Right. All part of that moving forward. Yep. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we look to make sure that we've got diverse representation and kind of the responsibilities and that's all filled up. But we, we want to encourage others to step up and be part of that leadership team. All right, uh, so the uh, upcoming work with our um, Indigenous cultures, uh, Laura, do you want to do this? So I know yeah. Abigail's here too, and she's been serving on that planning group too. Sure, we can tag team. So as a part of our continuing efforts um, to advance our JEDI trainings that were supported by the IDNR grant that we received that Mark mentioned earlier, um, we have been in communication with um, uh, the nature through an opportunity that was made available to us through the Nature Conservancy to utilize um, their Indian Country 101 trainings, which are free and online for everyone. So we're part of this is promoting their trainings, but then there would be a series of two cohorts that we would be um, able to utilize. And our first cohort is Indigenous Start in September of this year. 
and um, it would be targeted as an internal opportunity for our steering committee, our um, team leads, our GBI leads, so that we could sort of start this process to utilize this training and have facilitated discussions around the topic. Um, all of this is leading into both Congress, where we are very much interested in advancing uh, the collaboration and connections with our partners, as well as leading into a native-led climate summit that is being planned for January of 2025. It will be at Factor Woods, and um, uh, the cohort team, the planning team, and Madeline Tudor, I know you're still on the line, uh, uh, Brenna Ness from McHenry County and Gina Roxas from Trickster have been really, really leading this effort, and we are looking to support this and use our use this opportunity to advance all of our knowledge around how to effectively collaborate and um, and create partnerships with both our Native American partners and our community partners. Um, and then leading into the cap and work that is being um, envisioned and, and, and advanced uh, around co-creation workshops and uh, moving forward. And so please feel free, Abigail, to. to... No, that was a wonderful overview. And, <coughs> and you know, the Native Life Climate Summit, this was already something that was being planned, as you mentioned, by Church of Focus. And so the opportunity to be able to support and lift and advance in the ways that our tribe and partners are interested in and in our community and local areas for us to step up into. For example, one of the real areas of interest is about food sovereignty. And there are deliberate and really important connections between food sovereignty, biodiversity, climate, right? And so when we think about broadening that tent, we think about the slide that Ted had with intersectionality of all of these issues. This is a really great example of being able to say, boy, we're working on this. We already want this. Let us help you mm -hmm. do this. So showing up in the places where people need that kind of support um, is something that I think the work is Thank you. Thank you. Any other thoughts, comments? Otherwise, we have a presentation here. Gabe is with us, Director of Resource Management and President of the Illinois Prescribed Fire Council to <laughs> share a draft plan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Almost afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the invite here today. I think well, I'm talking about fire. Hopefully, it'll warm me up. Right? It is definitely cold here. I like that as a instructor. Keep the class cold so you don't fall asleep. Uh, it definitely makes a big difference. Um, so uh, you can. I'm not sure how the slides are going to work here. We, we've got an outline, but if you could switch maybe to the next slide. All right, thank you. So, so why I'm here and how we got here was the Chicago Wilderness actually created a community wildfire preparedness plan. Uh, back in 2013 that expired in August of 2023. As Ted was talking about applying for a lot of these uh, federal grants and some of the IRA stuff, we started looking at that when it came out and you needed to have a CWPP that was going to be relevant or didn't need to be updated for the life of that grant. So that told me we weren't, we weren't going to make it with this thing expiring in August of 2023. So I started reaching out to some of the partner organizations that had contributed to that um, and everybody was interested in getting it done, but not really how are we going to make this happen. So I agreed to sort of take the lead on that, both in my role as the Director of Resource Management at the Forest Preserves and then also as the President of the Illinois Prescribed Fire Council. I thought this would be a good experience for me, and, and it has been. So working with the groups, I wanted to make sure that we kept the CW stay under that umbrella. We wanted, we wanted that recognition, that acknowledgement. So I started, I talked to Patty Vitt, uh, and my colleague at the Lake County Forest Preserve, who is the chair of the Managing Healthy Landscapes group. So she was the, 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 the champion for us here with Chicago Wilderness getting in the door. Great excitement with that team. Then we came to the executive council and we were looking to try to figure out the funding piece on how to make this happen. Um, so 
everybody was really excited about it, but we just couldn't figure that out because of all of those different connections. So at that point, I just decided to take that on in my role as the Forest Preserves of Cook County. Former General Superintendent Arnold Randall supported that idea, and so that, that piece was addressed there. Then putting together a working group. So as you can see on the slide here, uh, I was able to pull a, a Booze Brothers and, and get the two original authors. So we were able to put the band back together with Steve Creech and Leslie Burns. Uh, most of you probably know Leslie, who was uh, DuPage County Forest Preserve and Lake County Forest Preserve. She was also on the Illinois Prescribed Fire Council. She was she was great to add back to the team. Steve is a uh, uh, Indiana DNR person who has a lot of experience on the federal level. Uh, so having having those two folks on there was great. As far as the GIS component, we brought in Lindsay Darling, who I know a lot of you probably know through her work with Chicago Regional Tree Initiative. Uh, uh, she did a phenomenal job for us uh, with this working group. Brittany Balmer, who also works on my team, uh, also played a key role in, in, in the writing of this document. And I also have to give a quick shout out to Living Habitats, Hiding the Tourist Team. That's the consultant we worked with that uh, I have a contract with under a, a larger contract that we manage at the Forest Preserve. Uh, next slide, please. So when we started to um, develop the plan we were just looking to do a quick update it, and the other thing to understand is um it, it only covers the six counties you know uh, which is on the next slide but i just want to make that point because part of the initial conversations we had early on with the with the working group the healthy habits uh, landscape one and the executive council was could we do this at a larger scale and i think this is a model now that we have in place when we get more funding through a larger grant that, that's the plan so i just want to make that point clear um, but as we started to move forward, we realized that we couldn't just do a revision and basically we had to sort of rewrite this plan. The idea was to, um, you know, keep it simple and get done before the plan expired in August of 2023. And <laughs> where are we at now, right? So the best plans is, as we've heard several times today, you got to be patient, you got to keep working at this. And I feel like we did that and we I feel like what we're presenting here today is a, is a really good document. And really to be clear, what I'm here for today is wanting to get the official sort of, we support this document, we're behind it. Um, so we can keep that Chicago wilderness uh, as part of the title of this document. All right, next slide. So real quick, just so you understand what the goals of this document are and, and why we put it in place. So. This is sort of a unique document for urban areas, really. It, it's really something that you see more out west or where you really have a, what we call a wildland urban interface, where you have people building their homes in the middle of fuels that are going to burn and potentially burn their houses down. So for us, when this document was put in place a number of years ago, it, it, was, a, it was a unique situation. But it's key to being able to apply for a lot of these federal grants. You, you need to have the CWPP. So when we started to look at this again and identify what the risks were based on that wildland urban interface, we realized that we were going to have to make some changes based on the amount of development that's occurred even since this document was first put in place back in 2013. And so our real main focus ended up coming on three sort of key components. One is the smoke impacts. Two is the change in climate change since this document was originally put together. Not that most of us in this room didn't believe it then, but we certainly believe it even more so now. And then the, the third piece is that disadvantaged community piece that, again, Ted mentioned in the federal grants a lot of times, you have to have that component in there. So that was a focus of our revision on this particular document. You can see the goals on the slide there. I'm not gonna read all, all those for you. It's pretty basic stuff. Anyone who's, who's aware of the fire piece. The other key thing I want to point out real quick, this is a sidebar for anyone at the county level that has a hazard mitigation plan that you're a part of or your organization's a part of. The other cool thing is I'm, I'm part of the working group with the larger Cook County. We're tying this plan to the bigger hazard mitigation plan. That's another avenue for funding to be able to do work related to fire. So you can tag this on to something and again, make another connection for funding, which is going to be critical for all of us. All right, next slide. So this is the six counties that are involved in this. And I, I feel strongly that we have a, a process and a model now that when we go out for this larger scale grant for doing some of the work that's indicated in this document, this will be one of the pieces we can add on is expanding the CWPP to other counties, other groups that wanna be part of this. 
All right, at this point, I'm going to switch to the next slide and turn it over to uh, Lindsay Darling. The rest of our team should be on here, even Steve Creech, who's in the Badlands. Mm -hmm. So, hello. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the methodology that we use in this project. Um, so, our first thing was to identify layers that show wildfire risks, hazards, and values. And I'll define those all a little bit more later. Then we use GIS to combine these layers to show level of concern across the six county Chicago region. So for risks, can you go to the next slide, please? These are areas where human activities have the potential to result in wildfire. So to identify these areas, we use historical fire data from January 2013 to December 2022. These data came from the National Fire Incident Reporting System. We found that there were over 23,000 fires in that decade. We geocoded those fires to the zip code scale and then calculated how many fires occurred per acre. We then categorized areas either having high, medium, or low fire risk. Next slide. Next are hazards. So this is where do we have wildland fuels? So to identify these, we ranked vegetation based on its volatility for ignition and its potential to make smoke impacts. We identified vegetation using the 2021 National Land Cover Database, or the NLCD. So this data set shows land cover across the entire United States, and it has a whole bunch of categories. Many of them are more urbanized areas. So that's the area that you see on gray on the map that we defined as not hazardous. Then within the vegetation, we defined areas of agriculture as low hazard, areas with forests and shrublands as medium, and then grasslands as high. Next slide, please. Then we looked at values. So values are defined as natural or developed areas where loss, interruption of services, or destruction by wildfires would be unacceptable. It is known as the wildland urban interface or intermix. So interface are areas where high density housing is near hazardous vegetation and intermix, which you can see in the purple in that map is areas with low density vegetation that are near those uh, fuels. So this is a federal definition. And as it is federal, uh, the US Geological Service has put together a map for the entire United States showing those buoy areas, which you can see here. Next slide. So here's where we get to do the, the fun GIS side of things. This is looking at level of concern. So to identify that, we combined the fuel volatility layer with the fire occurrence one. So we created this matrix where we set areas that had high fuel volatility. We gave them a ranking of five and then low down to one. And with fire occurrence, areas with lots of fires were a three and low were a one. We added those values together in each of these cells and said that areas where we have high fuel volatility and lots of fires occurring have the highest level of concern. And then areas with lower fuel volatility and lower level of fire occurrences have the lowest level of concern. Next slide. So we showed that level of concern layer within those defined WUI areas. And I'll get into this a little bit more with a table, but briefly you can see that within those WUI areas, most of them are at that lower level of concern. Next slide. So big picture, um, across the uh, region in that uh, 2013 to 2023 decade, there were over 23,000 fires. There are over a million acres of wildland fuels with the majority of them, or most of them being in Will County. Uh, within WUI, very little of our region as defined as WUI, only 4.2%. Lake County has the most wooey area, both by land and percentage of it that is covered by wooey. Next slide. So digging into that level of concern, as we saw on the map, most of the wooey areas were in that lowest level of concern. And the entire region, only around 1,600 acres, were in that high category. So the big picture takeaway is that the national scale wooey definitions may not effectively demonstrate how wildfire could impact people and communities in the Chicago region, as there's very little federally defined wooey land in the region. And within that land, there's generally a low level of concern as there are very few fires or low fuel volatility type. So in urbanized areas, uh, while many of our communities and properties may not be directly impacted by fire, we contend that they may be impacted by smoke. And with that, I'm gonna pitch it over to Stephen Creech. 
Uh, it's still morning, uh, at least out here uh, from interior uh, South Dakota, uh, just uh, outside the Badlands. So um, most of you will, will remember that um, last summer, even Chicago was impacted by smoke from uh, fires up in the Canadian provinces. And I just looked at a, a, a plume from the national, uh, a, a video from the National Weather Service showing a smoke plume already in the United States from fires in Idaho, Montana, and uh, Northern California. And that smoke plume is starting to work its way uh, even towards us. So uh, fire by definition is rapid oxidation producing light, heat, and smoke. And uh, we know that both wildfires and prescribed fires uh, produce smoke, but the difference is that for wildfire, for prescribed fire, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, does regulate both the gaseous and the particulate emissions from, uh, from fires, from particularly prescribed fire. Um, when we do prescribe fire, the Illinois Natural uh, History Survey from 2022 made a comment that it was similar to someone uh, smoke from a wildland or from a prescribed fire was similar to someone operating a lawnmower uh, for a period of time. So um, the, the difference between prescribed fire and wildfire is prescribed fires uh, do, they dedicate a great deal of their plan uh, to smoke management. How are they gonna manage where that smoke goes and how much smoke do they create? Uh, the National Weather Service out of Romeoville uh, has even created a, um, a, a whole section in their forecast uh, dealing just with smoke management. They look at mixing heights, uh, how high into the, into the atmosphere will our smoke mix up, uh, what are the ventilation rates, in other words, how quickly will that smoke vent up, uh, how, will it, how fast will it be transported away from the area uh, by looking at transport wind speed and direction and they look at stability in the lower atmosphere, letting us know how easily uh, our smoke is going to lift uh, and be put up into the uh, upper atmosphere and dispersed. So we look at things like um, the, all these things come together basically to help prescribe fire, minimize smoke impacts to people. But if you look at the, the wildland fire side, uh, those fires don't occur on ideal weather days. They don't, um, they don't necessarily follow the rules of order uh, that the EPA has established for, for gases in particular admission. And if you look at the slide um, that shows 3.3 uh, million residents uh, live within a quarter mile of hazardous fuels. And then the 7.9 million, if you round up, uh, live within one mile. So you can see that the impact from smoke from wildfires is actually fairly significant. Not only does it impact people, but it can impact um, transportation corridors. You know, you've got O'Hare, Midway, uh, numerous interstates that go through the area. Um, we, then we went on to look at smoke tends to impact uh, disadvantaged communities in a, at a greater degree than they do normal, you know, the, the, the less uh, disadvantaged communities because those communities have higher rates of respiratory diseases uh, and they're less likely to have uh, good uh, heating and ventilation, heating and air conditioning ventilation systems to help filter that air down. Uh, one more point and then I'll step aside and that is to mention that um, this is not just a, even though it's a localized area, six counties in the Chicago area, uh, but we expand, when we expand this out, it will include, it can include much of the state because what John and the group has done is created a template that anyone could take and uh, <clears throat> create their own CWPP. So uh, I know Ben Snyder, who's the fire uh, uh, supervisor from Illinois is on this uh, call. And uh, I, we're hoping to get uh, Kenneth Jolly, the state forester, to sign off on his plan as well. So uh, with that, thank you very much. And uh, so long from the Badlands.
All right, uh, next slide, please. And uh, Leslie Burns is gonna. Sure, talk I'm gonna talk rant. about um, what we developed as this action plan table. Um, and um, all of our action plans revolve around three things, fire occurrence and reporting, uh, management of fuel loads and wildfire response. Um, most of our current data came from this National Fire Institute reporting system, NIFERS, where the 23,000 records came from across the, the last decade. Um, that unfortunately data can really only be used as a current data. Um, we know from that data, we have a wildfire on a particular date in somewhere in this location. And that's about all we can gather from that data. And it would be nice if that data was a lot more complete, um, better location, the, even just the size of the wildfires. You know, we don't know if these wildfires are a few square meters or, you know, 25 acres. There, there's just no way to tell. So we would like to see um, the fire departments do a better job of putting in that information. And the second part is there's a lot of missing data. If a wildfire occurs on some of the agencies and the agencies are responding to that wildfire, um, that doesn't get put into the, the NIFERS data. So the 23,000 is probably an understated number. So that's one of our first um, uh, questions. I also want to throw in there IDNR under the Forest Resource Services has a mobile app for uh, wildfire. Um, we'd like to see that picked up by more entities and then develop a way to report those um, fires into the, the national database. As far as management of fuel loads, um, it would be increased funding for mechanical or prescribed fire in high level of concern areas so we can keep those fires tamped down when and if they do occur. Um, and then defensible spaces, creating defensible spaces in our, our preserves, uh, mostly through a, a better master planning um, would be ideal. And last is our wildfire response. Most of this involves um, cross-training for structural fire departments and fire protection districts. Um, the Illinois Fire Service Institute offers um, what's called a G130-190, which is based on the National Wildfire Coordinating Group, um, basic wildfire, wildland firefighter um, training um, to get more funding that local fire departments have more of their personnel go through that um, training. Um, and then cross-training, bringing those folks out to prescribed fires so they actually get on the ground experience on how to deal with wildfires so that the proper response when wildfires occur actually happens. Um, uh, next slide. And I'll just kind of wrap this up. Here's that. Uh, disadvantaged communities area and wild land in interface, urban interface. Um, so this was another part of, of this new plan that we didn't include in the plan 10 years ago. Um, the last part we didn't, well, I don't really have a slide in here. We did look at climate change um, using the 2021 assessment of impacts of climate change in Illinois that was produced by the Nature Conservancy. Um, I think most of you might be familiar with that document. Um, how climate change will impact our, our fire seasons. Um, it's a little hard to determine yet, um, but it will impact our fire seasons. We're likely to have a shift in when those fires can occur, when the appropriate uh, conditions occur are likely to change. Um, uh, micro droughts in the summer, um, and then maybe less snow cover in the winter. So, uh, but we didn't really make predictions as to how those will affect fire yet. And I think the last, I'll kick it back to, to Lindsay. Yeah, the, the last slide. Lindsay, let me make a comment real quick here to make sure 
Another key component of this plan was we had this smaller working group that is the folks that you just heard here, but we shared this document out a couple times with a larger working group, which is represented here. And you know, John Peters was part of that team and a couple other folks in the fire community and some folks that weren't in the fire community, but were, were contributing based on what their area of expertise was. So I just want to make it clear that this was a very uh, inclusive process that we did go through with this document. All right, Lindsay. Yeah, just uh, since this was a really data driven and GIS forward project, we wanted to get everybody the ability to work with these layers, even if they don't have a GIS system. So I put together an interactive map that has all of the layers that were in this report, um, the smoke, hazards, risks, areas of concern. Uh, you can turn those layers on and off, zoom in, um, you know, take screenshots if you need something for a, a grant that you're applying for. So I hope this really makes this usable by a, a greater audience. Okay. Terrific. This hey. is amazing work, John. Thank hey. you. Questions? <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Um, will you talk a little bit about uh, the need for more frequent prescribed burning and how to support the organizations like Conservation Land Trust and Conservancy because of the insurance issue? But uh, there's a liability, there's less frequent burning, and uh, how that fits into the big picture of wildfires. Right. Yeah, that, that's like a whole nother hour. Um, but yeah, it, it's something that's being worked at really, I mean, we are as the fire council working on that, you know, it doesn't impact us as a forest preserve because of our government, uh, you know, level and, and insurance and all that kind of stuff, but it is a critical component and it's, it's mentioned in this document. It's a, it's a key part of this document that obviously prescribed fire needs to be utilized much more often and to limit some of these impacts from the wildland fire side of things. And really for us with the heavier fuels, emerald ash borer, we got a lot of down heavy fuels. You get a wildfire, that stuff gets burning. It could be smoking for a couple of days where you're impacting these smoke sensitive targets that we have. Like again, they there had to be an ordinance in place 30, 40, 50 years ago to build a school, a hospital or a nursing home. It had to be next to a forest preserve because that's what's next to all of our properties where we have now smoke sensitive targets that we got to work around, right? So yes, that's a key component of this document and really the bigger picture for us from the fire council side of things. All right, I saw a hand back here. Yeah, the biggest risk I see in the suburbs here is um, subdivisions put in houses within 30 feet of a protected mark and they put vinyl siding on it. Is there some way of contacting the statewide organizations that make zoning recommendations to say, hey, if you got a Yeah, I, well, I think those developers probably have stock in vinyl siding too, right? <laughs> yeah, that we've seen that, right? And you, and you wonder, you got to say, how do people in this day and age in 2024 make these decisions? This information is readily available to everybody. Well, and, and developers. Well, yeah, and the horror stories too, right? That you've seen plenty of times on the news. So, no, don't disagree at all. That is something that that needs to be addressed. I put a lot of money on, on the, how many wildfires there were in the last 10 years. I had no concept there would be 23,000. Do you have any insight from the ignition source? For well, well, again, let's be, let's be honest. Around here, most of that is arson, right? It's going to be, we call it a wildfire, but it was started through cigarette out the window, somebody dumping their coals from a barbecue grill again. People think that's a good idea. Here's a hollow tree. Let's dump my coals in there, right? Or in a natural area. So these are the things that we experienced. As, as Leslie pointed out, or Lindsay, I believe that the, this information is not very good though. So there's a lot of people working on making that information better. DNR, the app Ben Snyder has, um, uh, the fire council, we have our fires accomplished map as an example. So, and even at the federal level, national level, there's a lot of work being done on improving that information. Emily? So now that you guys have created this template, how much uh, work would you say it would be, I don't know how you want to quantify that hourly or, or what, uh, to take it statewide or to other regions? Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, we, we've been working on this for well over a year. 
So it, it just, it's, it's the people you, if you're doing something for like a County level, you have to have people that are going to do the work then. So the template and the plan that we have in place, I think is good. It's just people have to then do that work, right? You have to sit down and, and work through all these things as it relates to that specific area that you're putting this plan together for. So I, I don't think if we were going to do a, at a much larger scale using this template, if you, again, two years time that you could work on something with multiple partners at a much larger scale than just the six counties. John, maybe if you're, when you're ready, if you want to do a cafe or on that topic, then we could invite partners from around the region mm -hmm. and, and Wisconsin, Indiana, Michigan, even to take a look at yeah. what we've done. That would great. Be great. I mean, yeah. it's similar. It reminds me of the Oak study, right? It started with the sample and then it grew as a template and you've created that now, which that can be replicated and then everybody has to lean and put some muscle and some resources into it. So it's awesome. So, so today, again, thank you. You have this as a draft for approval. Um, and so you're looking for us to approve the document as prepared or is it coming back or is you want it all ready to go today? Or you, you feel it's in in place to accept it today? Uh, okay. Yeah. okay. I just had a lot of questions, but it doesn't have to be part of this. Um, just kind of what were some of the grants that you were missing out on due to this not being updated? Well, just to the IRA, there's a lot of funding coming through the Forest Service for wildland fire work. And so trying to figure out a way to, again, it would be a larger grant with multiple organizations. I mean, one, we want to get more advanced training, which actually Patty Vitt has taken the lead on. I'm going to start working with her on that, like the burn training. So we do the Chicago Wilderness. We're looking at burn boss training related to burning in these areas. Um, fuel reduction. Everybody I talk to in the region has dead ash, has dead oaks on the ground that's creating smoke impact. So how do we get funding for that? Just training, right? This fire department across all these things that we're looking to generate dollars for from any of these funding sources we can we can find. So this is a key way. It's got the mitigation stuff in the document, which is what makes it so valuable. Even the same thing with me tying it to the HMP. I can't put it in a hazard mitigation plan if you're not mitigating the hazard. We're mitigating the hazards. We've got a lot of answers to that. So that's what makes this document so valuable. Yes, ideally we would get a concurrence from the group today. Um, I mean, there's still like, even though we feel like we've been over this a hundred times, this document, we're still making minor changes, but nothing substantive is going to change at this point. Um, so yes, we would like the executive council to say, we support this document. Okay, that's great. That's awesome. Um, so the only other piece that I saw on it with our new branding, which we can provide to you, make sure it's Chicago Wilderness Alliance. So it's representative of our new look and, and who we are. Uh, with that, though, I will take a motion. Um, do you want to? Do you want to put a motion and advance it forward as our lead here? Put a motion on okay. the floor to approve this document. Thank you. Second, and Emily, we have a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, motion by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. All right, we have an approved document. Thank you so much for the great work. This is exactly what the Alliance, again, a perfect example. We've seen several today talked about of how a partners get together an idea, they build kind of the framework, and then it can be replicated in advance to a larger scale. So thank you on that. Just a few quick announcements because lunch is here, and then we do have a tour for those that are here in person. Um, just a shout out, Urban Rivers, which is one of our partners, did receive the Parker Gentry Award. So congratulations to them. Uh, July is National Parks and Recreation Month uh, across the country, but also I know Illinois has adopted that as a state piece of awareness, and I'm not sure if Indiana, Wisconsin, or Michigan has, has done such, but it's great to see that there's a focus on that, so uh, celebrate that. And then uh, there are many ballot initiatives that have been advanced forward in the region um, for the general election, uh, whether it be for a uh, uh, limiting rate increase through property taxes or through bond issuances. And I know for the district, we have one that we've advanced forward with immediate opportunity because it's a savings because we're paying off our debt. So 
Uh, it's actually a reduction, but the language is difficult. Um, I know King County, Lake County, uh, Will County has moving forward with some initiatives in DuPage. So there's a lot of activity. Um, so I just want to make aware one of the things that was asked for the Alliance is would we uh, endorse um, a ballot initiative as the Alliance? And I guess that's up for further discussion to come forth. I know the Alliance has supported with communication, helped to facilitate cafes to provide awareness to our partners that happen to live in all these action alerts and things like that. So that is the role that the Alliance um, obviously is ready and set up to do uh, between now and, and November. And if there's others from others that are make aware, let's make connections. Emily. And I would just add that if um, any organization here would like to endorse any of the ballot initiatives, um, will just let to their board, so they're done. Uh, but the page came like Lake and McHenry, uh, just let me know. And I'll say, we'll get you on our full list of questions. Do you want to do an action alert for that? I do. That? We're not ready yet. Okay. But, um, in the next couple okay. of weeks. I'll be ready. I'll be waiting. Okay. okay. And then I do want to acknowledge, and Ed Collins just entered in the room here, but Ed Collins, who is a founding member of the Alliance here, has announced his retirement. And um, so, uh, Ed, I have to announce that because, uh, no, he's been preparing me for, for some time and I'm still not uh, settling into it. But I just want to thank him for his leadership, his vision. Um, he is also a recent recipient, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Midwest Region a Silver Eagle honoree. Well, he's now going by Silver Eagle. Silver Eagle is what I call him. Say the Silver Eagle is in the room. Silver okay. Eagle's flying, <laughs> Silver Eagle. He's landed. <laughs> and then I just freaking out, but also to add, um, it started roughly in this building, is that Friends of Action Act, and while at the that recognizes the friends group of the year. So again, the power partnership, stronger yep. together. That's exactly what this is all about. So kudos there. Any other announcements from those at home or those at work and those that are here? Shout outs. Okay, before we adjourn, I do know we have, after we have lunch here, there will be a field trip to the Hackmatack National Wildlife Refuge with the additional acreage. Uh, so uh, thank you, Emily and Vince and Ed are, are facilitating that that tour. Anything you want to highlight on for those that uh, what to expect here in any direction before we break for lunch and adjourn the meeting? I think we have vehicles, right? We do have vehicles. So if anyone would like to go, um, my vehicle would be going as we have one, two, three, four drivers. Four drivers. So just let uh, me know if you'll be attending. We're going to be going to our newest acquisition, Camera Farm, which is the thousand acre. Uh, property that was purchased uh, earlier this year by Illinois Audubon, Open Grant, and the uh, Conservation Fund. Um, and we'll probably be stopping by another property that Open Lands owns where uh, Friends of Hackett Act received a $975,000 uh, federal award for the community directed funding or earmarks from Congresswoman Underwood that's currently underway and are doing a great job and, and this is kind of spearheading uh, that. Um, so I don't know how much time we need before we head out. Are the lunches arrived? Lunches are here. Okay. okay. So, so we'll I, adjourn. I you grab you your lunch and then we'll we'll head out. So if I can take a motion to adjourn for today's meeting, we'll see everybody back again on October 16th, if not before. So moved. So moved by Mark. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Kathy. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, too. All right. Any further discussion? Otherwise, all those in favor, motion by saying aye. 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 Aye, those opposed? Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you doing this. Sorry you can't be here, um, but we look forward to seeing you in person soon. Great meeting. Bye.